All right, welcome to the program. Where, do, where really should we start from? Let me take your t uh, let me have your take on the GDP numbers. I don't think I've spoken to you since the GDP numbers came out. Um, 2.55 percent for the final quarter of 2019, full year 2.2 to 7. Um, the question is, what kind of recovery are we making? Is it a is it an L shape, a U shape, or a V shape? What what shape or what shape are you attributing to okay. it? Um, before I even go to the shape, uh, if you want to look at it, you want, if you want to plot the graph mm -hmm. of the GDP of performance in the first last quarter, four quarters of 2019, in the first quarter GDP grew by 2.1 percent, second quarter it grew by 2.12 percent, third quarter it grew by 2.28 percent, and the final quarter it grew by 2.55 percent. So if you if you want to plot that as a graph, you will see the gradient is very slow. Uh, it's a um, upwardly sloping but slow gradient. So it's an upwardly sloping gradient, but the gradient is very uh, it's not steep. Okay. So um, in effect, the rate of acceleration of the improvement in GDP is not fast. I mean, if you look at the fact that you started the first quarter of the year 2.1 and ended the last quarter at 2.55. So you see, I'm still in the region of 2.2%, which is why at the end of the year, we ended it with an annual GDP of 2.27%. So in effect, um, you would say there's an improvement, but this improvement is quite slow. Um, what we're, we're now stuck in slow growth that is slower than the rate of population growth. And that's where the challenge is. In as much as the GDP is growing, if we were a mature economy like in um, UK, US, and we're growing at 2.27%, we'd we'll be happy. Because our population growth may be less mm -hmm. than 1%. Mm -hmm. And then you would have had the almost all the sector of the economy matured. People wouldn't be in the level of poverty that we are currently witnessing today. So but uh, for our state of economic development, we need a growth rate that is close to 10%, if not more than 10%, for us to leave people out of poverty, for, what, for us to reduce the number of unemployed, for us to have a more inclusive growth. My, uh, my second take on the GDP figure is that it's also um, the growth is uh, not what you may call a stable growth in, in the sense that uh, it's, uh, if you adjust for the growth in oil, sec oil and gas sector, which grew by 6.36%, you realize that the entire growth of the non-oil sector accounts for about 93% of the GDP only grew by 2.26%. So you can say the growth was fragile, and it's also still vulnerable to changes or movement in the price of crude. So our current growth is highly vulnerable to changes or movement in the price of uh, crude, and it's very, uh, it's very fragile in the sense that should oil prices drop drastically, then you could actually see a reversal of the growth rate we saw in the last quarter. Okay. I'm still sticking with these GDP numbers. Uh, when you take a look at it, of course, I've done the analysis at least in the last two days. Is there a plus or a minus for you looking at those numbers? What are the pluses? What are the minuses? Okay, for me, the pluses are one, uh, the bright lights or the bright spots are sectors like the telecommunication sector that is currently accounting about 13% 13, 13 of the GDP and grew by 8.5%. If we have three or four sectors, that are weighty in terms of contribution to the GDP growing at that rate, then the economy will be doing quite well. Unfortunately, the sector that are the, the largest contributor to the GDP, which are the agricultural sector, which account for about 26%, account for about 26% of the GDP in the fourth quarter, only grew by 2.1%. Despite all the incentives that have been pumped into that sector to fasten the rate of growth rate. Then, in the next sector, the trade sector, which is the second largest contributor to the GDP, contributes about 15.99% of the GDP. It's contracted by 0.58%. Then if you move to the next sector, which is the telecommunications, which I said is a bright light, it grew by 8.5%. But that was also a still a decline over its previous quarter growth rate. Then the next one is the manufacturing sector, which accounts for about 8.7% of the GDP, but also grew by only 1.24%. So we are stuck in a very slow growth uh, environment. And these sectors, if you consider the fact that agri agriculture accounts for 26%, if you add that to 16% of the trade sector, uh, and then you add that to 13% uh, percent of the telecommunication sector and the manufacturing sector, you are already more than 50% 
of the GDP. So should these sectors grow at the same rate that we're witnessing growth in the telecommunication sector, then we would have just defined as a country. Um, what, reality check, what reality check does uh, uh, do this uh, GDP report, what reality check does it really present? Because since you've said there are pluses, there are minuses, is there any reality check that is really staring us in the face that we really need to attend to? Well, I mentioned the first one in passing mm. that the growth is really fragile yeah. in the sense that it's being driven by the oil and gas sector. And should anything happen to the oil and gas sector, we could actually have a negative or very weak growth. That's one factor. The other factor is that uh, the private sector, and, uh, which should be a lesson for the uh, economic managers, the sector that is largely driven by the private sector is the fastest growing of all the major sectors, and that's the ICT sector. So it then means that should we create an environment that is similar to the environment or the regulatory environment that uh, the information and telecommunication sector is subject to, we may have similar growth in the electricity sector. You know, remember, remember that we tried to privatize or we privatized uh, the uh, electricity sector. But unfortunately, that privatization process felt has failed to achieve commercial viability. So we have not been able to appropriate the kind of benefit associated with having the electricity sector in the private hands. So we should look at that. Look at the construction industry. Construction, major construction activities are largely still dominated by the government. And some of us have advocated that should we hand over some of the critical uh, commercially viable infrastructure to the private sector to build, we may be able to attract fresh capital into that sector and then fast track the rate at which that sector will develop. So that, that one is sector. Then, similarly, if we go to the manufacturing sector that is stuck at a growth rate of 1.24%, despite the injection of liquidity from credit uh, emanating from the lower interest rate environment created by central bank, we are still not seeing the kind of growth we see in that sector. Mm -hmm. What is hobbling or what are the limiting factors to the growth in the manufacturing sector? Some of them are infrastructure deficiencies. So we need to begin to identify some of these problems and begin to deal with the power sector supply. Power, su I mean power supply. I had mentioned the power as a sector on mm. its own. Then you look at transport infrastructure. I had mentioned that in the area of construction. So we should have an integrated and holistic plan on how to develop the economy, which we look at the infrastructure supply and look at the sector that have strong prospect of growth. And then look at those sectors we have comparative advantage. When I looked at the GDP figures and I looked at the refining sector. You know, the crude oil sector grew by 6.36%. But when you flip it and you look at the refining sector, the downstream sector, it's contracting because no refining is, no, no refining is taking place. So why should we continue to produce crude and continue to import refined pet petroleum products? Mm -hmm. it's, I mean, it's no brainer that we must be one of the only countries in the world that export crude and import refined petroleum products. Despite the fact we have one of the best crude in the world mm. that's easy to re yeah. refine. Best sulfur content and all of that. Now, you talked a bit about CBN. Let's take a look at regulators um, in general, talking about leather, whether the Central Bank, the Securities and Exchange Commission, and all of that. If I'm looking at what's happening globally, I'm seeing the sense that a lot of uh, policy makers have taken, or a lot of regulators have taken, you know, some kind of stance, a different stance perhaps from the ordinary job. We saw what happened even with the Fed in the US in 2008, till even about now, when did, did they even leave quantitative easing? The ECB, which Christian Lagarde heads now, right now, is also talking about some things to help jolt up Europe. Do you think that? Uh, uh, or what options do policymakers have? When I say policymakers, not just CBN in our case, not just SEC, the Ministry of Finance inclusive. What options do these policymakers uh, have right now, especially with these global economic disruptions that we're seeing? You can start from the <coughs> central bank in terms of, like me, when I take a look at it, I'm beginning to see that perhaps monetary is the new fiscal is the new fiscal. <laughs> I hope you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yes, yeah. you know. Okay, my take is that uh, if you look at what the central bank can do, one would ordinarily think the central bank is already overreaching itself. 
uh, in the sense that uh, because of uh, some level of uh, uh, vacuum in the fiscal space, the central bank is playing not just monetary policy roles, but also playing some level of fiscal policy roles. You did mention earlier that uh, you're going to be um, screening the visits of the CBN governor to the minister of FCT, uh, where I believe they discussed on land allocation mm -hmm. to dairy uh, dairy farmers. farmers. I mean, that, is ordinary, that ordinary should go beyond the purview of the central bank. Uh, that should be the duty of the Minister of uh, Industries um, or Minister of Trade. Um, and, um, but obviously, because something is missing, uh, they say na nature abhors the vacuum. Uh, the key thing is that there is just a limit to what the monetary policies can do. The monetary policy will not materially uh, influence the supply of uh, fiscal infrastructure in an economy. You need a fiscal ins infrastructure to be a competitive producer. You need a fiscal infrastructure to support foreign direct investment. Monetary policies will not address the issue of insecurity. So the, the just a limit to what monetary policies can do. For you to have the kind of development we're looking for, there has to be some level of uh, improvement in all the policy spaces, okay. both fiscal policy and monetary policies. Particularly fiscal policies. The budget has been signed into law um, in, J in December, and uh, one would expect that you're going to see some level of heightened yeah. activity in the fiscal space. But we don't seem to be seeing that. Um, today, the country's reserve is be being depleted, um, and uh, we've not heard anything concrete on the side of the fiscal authorities. I'll give an instance. Um, through the fiscal tools, apart from the fact that they're trying to borrow about $3.3 .3 billion from the um, Eurobond space um, to obviously so show up the current reserve and uh, improve the liquidity they need for capital, um, for the budget implementation. One should expect that we, at this time, we should be talking of concrete trade policies or industrial policies that are targeted at specific industrial groups where we have competitive advantage. We should not be talking of the heavy lifting. I did mention the issue of why we're importing mm. uh, refined petroleum products. Nobody has said anything about, are we going to continue to subsidize the refined petroleum products forever? Have we really improved, has the subsidy improved our standard of living? Do you see that the average poor person on the, on the street is enjoying this subsidy to the extent that his standard of living is improving or is deteriorating? If you are having an increase in the number of extremely poor in your country, then it simply means that the, uh, the social tools or the social intervention tools you have put in place is not effective. So you should devise another So model. you should revise them. Mm -hmm. So if you have a system that is not leading to the objective you have set out to achieve, then that system is not effective and you have a duty to pull back and look at what works. I don't think the subsidy on petroleum product is working. It has not improved the standard of living of the average Nigerian. Do you the think the average Nigerian to this extent has even understood that this subsidy has to be taken away because in other words, it's not really making our lives better. Do you understand? So perhaps that's <coughs> where the government is also having a dilemma in terms of they don't want uproar, they don't want a social unrest when uh, they take out the subsidy. Because President Jonathan did it in 2012. A lot of people did call for, oh, no, 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 no. Even some people in government now <laughs> spoke against it. But do you think that it's a divide between politics. It's a divide definitely between politics and economy, which supersedes. Well, Nancy, that's where leadership comes in. Yeah. Leaders are the ones who chart the course of action of the people. Sometimes a leader will take a cover course of action that is painful momentarily, but have the ultimate benefit of improving the standard of living of the citizens. It is the leader's duty to communicate. If you look at some of the attributes of a good leader, among which is communication uh, um, attribute. So you must be able to tell the citizens why the subsidy has to go. There's always a saying that some, when they tell you, some people are very good orators. They will tell you that if they tell you to jump, you can even ask how high should I, I jump. Hi, hi. So, but that's, that's what they call leadership. I remember during that time, um, Sanusi and um, the f Emir of Kanu now, Emir Mohammed Sanusi II, as well as Dr. Ngozi Konjo, where the ones going up and down, explaining to Nigerians, we need to take out the subsidy. Yes, and the, the key thing is this, like I said, an average Nigerian, a lot of Nigerians are really going through economic difficulties. So you're in a position where you can tell them, look, this method of intervening in your life is not as effective as we want it can be. I'll give you an instance. 
Uh, your people cover the road construction, the road issue in my village. The difference between the time that road was done and was not done and now is like day and night. Mm. The standard of living of people have improved. Mm. They are able to say their farm produce at much higher value. They no longer go to the market and go back with unsold stock. In fact, customers are pursuing them to come and buy their farm produce. So it has opened a lot more Yes, and they are able to extract more value. Assuming what we are doing was giving them handout to say, okay, continue with the bad road, we give you handout. But at that point, they couldn't be where they are today. And the quality of life has improved. Even, it will improve. So the key thing is this: yeah. an average Nigerian.